We're delighted to welcome Dr. Shirley Paulson. Dr. Paulson is a Christian Science Practitioner and Committee on Ecumenical Affairs for the Mother Church. She recently finished doctoral work on healing theologies of Christian Science, as well as on a little and a little-known ancient Christian text. Refer to your program notes for more information about her numerous activities and articles. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paulson, who will speak to us today on second generation Christians and second generation Christian scientists. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right. And I, I, you know, when I get to talk to people like you, I can't help but think about Paul, who was who said that he thanks God for every remembrance of you. And oh my goodness, I'm beginning to get a little glimpse of what that must be like uh, for Paul to have appreciated the workers, the people who faithfully pray and live this, this heart and soul of Christianity day in and day out through your hearts and through your hard work. And I am so grateful to get to be with you and to share this, this time with you. What an amazing um, privilege it is also to be with you at this time of amazing changes going on. And my message seems to have been God appointed for all of us because it's all about dealing with change. So I've been praying about this for a long time too, even before I was invited to be with you. So when I was first asked to give this talk, I understand that your, your mission, your theme for the year has been the lessons of healing with second generation Christians and, and second generation Christian scientists. And I thought maybe we ought to, since that time, we're ready to stretch this just a bit. And the stretching means that we're moving into second century Christian scientists because that's what we are. From Mary Baker Ready, we are no longer a second generation because none of us really knew her. Probably our parents didn't either. But we are in the second century. And it's also pertinent because the second century Christians were those who shared lives kind of like ours. They followed Jesus, none of them knew him personally, but they were devoted followers. So I think we have a lot we can share and with and learn from our second century fellow Christians. The other little addition to this talk or stretch is the little two little letter letters that got added to my name. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be done with that project and move on to the, <laughs> the doctor world. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, as I've been thinking about how to bring this conversation forward, the second century Christians and the second century Christian scientists in relationship to Jesus and to Mary Baker Eddy, that puts us in four different time periods that all have a purpose in being together. And the best metaphor I could find for how to work with this was a kaleidoscope. So with the help of amazing technicians in this world, we're gonna make this kaleidoscope work. Imagine picking up a kaleidoscope in your hands, looking at the beautiful jewels inside, shifting it and seeing a beautiful new design, and then shift it again and see another new beautiful design. You've all done that, right? So you're with me, you can see this kaleidoscope moving. <laughs> Right. The reason it's moving is that the, 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 the uh, metaphor here is that kaleidoscopes have inside of them beautiful gems. And those gems stay there while we shift the view. And I'm going to be talking about the beautiful gems of healing. The healing ideas that we're going to focus on. The way they stay there regardless of how the, sh the kaleidoscope shifts, the way our times shift. So, for example, we're going to talk about the ideas of healing that Jesus really introduced to the world. Now, I, I, you know, we'll talk about the fact that he was a Jew, so he didn't originate everything, but he had ideas that are profound, especially in terms of healing, which is our focus right now, too. And these ideas that we're going to focus on are threefold. One is that he lived the fact that God is both good and omnipotent. 
Now, Christians and theologians and scholars and all kinds of people have been trying to figure out how that's possible, especially lately. How is it possible to have a good God who's omnipotent? Because either God seems to be powerful and mean to let bad things happen, or else God is loving but just too weak to do anything about it. But Jesus lived and taught that God is both infinitely good and omnipotent. The second theme, one of these little gems in the kaleidoscope, is that evil does not have a legitimate existence. In fact, every time it presents itself, it's actually a fraud. It is proved to be untrue and not even present through the healing work that Jesus taught and demonstrated. The third theme that we see in Jesus and in these, these gems in the kaleidoscope is the fact that healing is an essential element of salvation. Salvation and healing cannot be separated. They're one and the same. Salvation is not just about what happens after you leave this body, but healing is what salvation means right now. So these three things we'll be finding throughout our travels. So we'll begin with, with Jesus and his world, understanding how these, these gems work together in his kaleidoscope view of things. <coughs> so realizing that he had these, this idea of the kingdom, the way the kingdom works, he was living in a human experience. The human experience in his day was that he was a Jew who lived in Roman, under Roman rule. And I'd like to ask you to think about what you know from your Bible reading that would tell you a little bit about the culture in which Jesus lived that influenced the way he expressed things. I'll give you just one example. You're familiar with the fact that he used sheep as a metaphor because people in those days understood the world, the work and world of a shepherd. What else do you know of Jesus' time that was, was expressing his culture? We have a couple of microphones, so you can just raise your hand and the microphone will come running itself wine. to you. I'm sorry? Wine. Wine. Okay, wine was used culturally then. So sheep, wine. There are a couple of hands back there, so just either speak up or get a microphone. Where are the microphones, by the way? Let me see where they are. Taxation by Caesar. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Yes, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Yes. Leavening in the meal. Fishermen. Yes. Fishermen. Potter. Potter. Planting seeds. Casting out devils. Planting seeds. Casting out devils. Okay, this is good. Th these are ways of understanding a little bit about what was going on culturally in Jesus' time where he was making his point about what these gems do. So, if we shift the kaleidoscope to the second century... Can we still find those gems, but in a new view? Now, again, so in the second century, um, this is where, again, we're going to relate to them because the second century people didn't get to walk with Jesus. They heard about him, they loved him, they were devoted to him, they followed him, but they, they were living in a different world. Now, some things were the same. They still lived under Roman rule. They were still persecuted. In fact, they were experiencing... Uh, this is a time of martyrdom for many people. Uh, and yet they, there was something about Jesus that they really wanted to follow. So I am especially intrigued with the way, the urgency with which this small band of Christians were struggling to distinguish themselves from the Jews and yet also be relevant to both the Romans and the Greeks. Now the Romans were basically the rulers and the Greeks were philosophers. And I think it's especially interesting to see how these second century Christians were questioned by the Greeks and saying, we can show you how our, a deeper way of thinking about these ideas that relate to the questions you're asking. And one of the big questions that they're asking is about Genesis, the creation. How did things happen? How does God create things? Where did evil come from? They were big questions that they were asking in the second century. And this is what a lot of the literature was about. Now, I'm, I'm going to share a video with you 
that will take about seven to eight minutes. The reason for putting a video in my talk to you is that it can explain better to you what I want to tell you than I can. <laughs> so um, this is just recently done, and it's going to take us on a little journey back into these ancient second century texts that have largely been lost to us. Recently found in 1945, as will be explained in the video. So this is about seven or eight minutes explaining these ancient texts that you need to understand to follow the rest of what I'm going to say. All natures, all forms, all creatures exist in and with one another. I love this verse that speaks of the interconnectedness of all things, but it's not in the Christian Bible. It's in the Gospel of Mary, one of the lost voices of early Jesus followers. My name is Deb Saxon, and I'm a professor of religion. I'd like to introduce you to some of the ancient texts outside the Bible that have transformed my own journey as a lifelong spiritual seeker on a Christian path. The Bible is often looked at as a single revelation that fell from the sky. But the word Bible itself actually means books, books written over more than 1,000 years in different places and from diverse points of view. A decade ago, I started to hear about newly discovered writings like the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, and many others. My first questions were, what did they say and where did they come from? Those questions started me on an adventure, and I'd like to give you some background for your own discovery of these lost voices. I'd always been taught that Christians had decided on what should be in the Bible early on. However, this is not the case. No universal church council ever made that decision in the first centuries. Some individuals circulated their opinions, and some regional councils discussed this. But even today, the Bibles of different branches of Christianity include different books. Recent discoveries reveal that in addition to the 27 books of the New Testament, there were over 100 other early writings used by followers of Jesus in the first three centuries of the Common Era. So to help get a handle on these, let's take a tour of some of the most important ones, where they come from and what they say. First, let's take another look at the Gospel of Mary. It's in a book bought by a German scholar in Cairo in 1896. It's not by Mary, it's about Mary. In it, she's the disciple who really gets it. She's the one who best understands Jesus, and it's her unwavering leadership that encourages her fellow male disciples to preach the gospel boldly, despite their fears of persecution. This is one of my favorite gospels because when I was growing up, women were not allowed to hold the highest positions of leadership, such as pastor or priest. And yet, here was a woman leading the disciples of Jesus. And then there are the Odes of Solomon, discovered in 1906, first century hymns with exquisite imagery that transcends traditional gender stereotyping of the divine. Open, open your hearts to the dancing joy of the Lord and let your love abound from heart to lips. Stand and be restored, for the right hand of the Lord is with you all, and she will be a helper for you. The largest finds occurred in the mid-1940s within a year or two of each other. The Dead Sea Scrolls found in Israel, near Jerusalem, and the books found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. However, they are unrelated in any other way. The scriptures in the Dead Sea Scrolls predate the time of Jesus, but the Nag Hammadi books include many whose content dates to the same time period as the books in the New Testament. In fact, early church leaders referred to some of these books, but for centuries there were no known manuscripts in existence. When a farmer looking for fertilizer stumbled upon a jar containing more than 50 books, it turned out that 40 of them 
were texts of which there were no other copies. My first foray into the Nag Hammadi scriptures was in reading the well-known Gospel of Thomas. Many of its sayings sound like what you would hear in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. In one, Jesus notices how, quote, drunk Thomas is because he has drunk from the bubbling spring that Jesus has provided. Notice how much this is like the living water, a spring welling up within that Jesus offers the Samaritan woman at the well in the Gospel of John. The Nag Hammadi texts, like the Gospel of Thomas and others, have been labeled, quote, Gnostic. But this is misleading. Some early church fathers use the simple term gnosis, meaning knowledge, to categorize text that they disagreed with. These writings were eventually lost or suppressed as diverse groups were forced to conform to the doctrinal mold of what became an official state church. And finally, there's the newest discovery of all, the Codex Chacos containing the Gospel of Judas. It was published by National Geographic in 2006. This book clearly reveals the presence of conflict among early Christ movements and has also sparked a hot debate about the role and motivation of Judas leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. The idea in studying these texts is not to replace the books that we have always read, not at all. But we can explore these newly discovered scriptures alongside those of the New Testament to open up new horizons. When we hear lost voices, we understand that before they fell silent, there were many ways of relating to Jesus, understanding his life and teachings, and his death and resurrection. One way became, quote, right, only when the other voices were excluded. But texts like the Gospel of Mary expand our view of early Christianity, allowing us to draw from all of the wisdom that arose during this period. Today, many people are finding newly discovered writings to be worth a deeper look for both their historic and their spiritual insights. Thank you for thinking about that. One of the reasons I'm so attracted to these ancient texts is that they were doing so much what we're doing. We're, we're exploring new ideas for Christianity. They're Christian, but they're new ways of thinking about things. That's what they were doing in the second century. And these texts are exploding with thoughts for us to, to consider now, as well as how we are thinking about how does Christian science relate to a new world. That's why this relates to our own subject about being second century. <laughs> followers. This text here is um, the one that grabbed my attention. As a Christian scientist, I found it about 15 years ago. It's called The Secret Revelation of John. And those of you who know Coptic will be able to read it. <laughs> it only exists in Coptic. Those texts that we found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt were translated from the original, from Greek, and we only have the translation in Coptic available. Maybe someday they'll appear in Greek. But if you see the K-A-T-A, -A, that means according to John. Underneath there is an A-P-O-K, which is apocryphon, which is translated as revelation. And then the rest of it's really hard to read. But anyway, that's the secret revelation of John. Uh, fortunately, I was able to read it in English. <laughs> But I did also have to study Coptic in order to know how, what I'm talking about in studying these texts. So I want to um, introduce you to that text. This is the book that grabbed my attention because in it, I found clearly these three things that we've been talking about from Jesus. The first, a third of the book of the secret revelation of John is all about God's goodness and omnipotence. It explains how there could be no other power, no other creation, all is good in God's realm, 
and God is infinite spirit. That's great. The second third of this book, by the way, the book is probably the same length as perhaps the, um, the book of Hebrews in our canonized Bible. So the middle third of this um, book is based on Genesis 2. It is changing and emphasizing some of the aspects of it to make really clear that the God who created the sinning, suffering man is not the same as the God who created through spirit. This false God is a jealous God who supposedly came from the fall of Sophia, or wisdom. That right there tells you it's a fraud because wisdom would not create its opposite and then be afraid of it. But this point about being a fraud is really critical to our understanding of how they are viewing evil in this text. The, the third part of the book is all about salvation from demons. The demons behave in a strangely familiar way, a similar way, the way we think about animal magnetism. I wish I could spend, I could spend a whole day talking about that. It's just fascinating. But the point is that um, it's all about salvation from these demons, which seem to bother us soul and body and disturb us through mental causes. So, again, <clears throat> the three themes are these gems inside the kaleidoscope. But we've shifted the kaleidoscope now to look at them from a different angle, from a different point of view in the second century. So the first theme, that God is all-powerful, that God in the secret revelation of John is all-powerful and good, but this God is depicted as father and mother and son. This God is immaterial, is both young and old, and is too great to be fully expressed by the human mind. It's complete, perfect, eternal, unlimited in every way. Now, think about this. Those words probably should sound familiar to you, but the interesting part again about this book is it's talking about creation. How did things happen? So this God in the secret revelation creates by gazing. Gazing or staring. In other words, it's a mental thing. One of the phrases in that text says, it's thinking becomes a thing. Isn't that amazing? It's thinking becomes a thing. The second theme that we found from Jesus <coughs> is that evil is not a legitimate or real power. Yaldabaoth is the name of this other god is a demiurge. Now that's a kind of a technical term, but it means there's another kind of God that is, um, creates the, the material world, the human world. So it's interesting how this writer of this text takes the second and third chapters of Genesis, changes it around a little bit, and calls that God Yaldabaoth. Now where did that God come from? <laughs> that God came from Again, Sophia, or wisdom, which is why I think of this as, as a fraud. Now, there are not many scholars who have found that conclusion yet, but when you read it from a Christian science lens, it's really obvious what's going on there. But at any rate, so this Yaldabaoth, and by the way, this is a picture that some think might be depicted as the Yaldabaoth of, of those days. Um, but he's, a, he's described as a jealous God who mocks everything that God does. He tries to create in his own image and likeness, but then discovers that man is a spark in him, a divine spark, and he's greater than Yaldabaoth, so he becomes jealous. And in his jealousy, he attempts to destroy man. This is where the, the flood of Noah comes from, for example. He also creates demons. Now, demons were, were ubiquitous. Everybody had knew and feared demons in those days. But this is where the demons supposedly came from, in the, according to this author. These demons are evil powers whose purpose is to make humans sick, sinning, and dying. And the demons also were weak because they didn't have any legitimate power. It didn't come from the God who gazes, who, who creates. They came from Yaldabaoth. So Yaldabaoth, who's trying to destroy everything, is found to be impotent because he doesn't have any real power. These demons 
behave in a, in a fashion that's quite similar to the way we've studied animal magnetism to behave. It's, a, it's a, something that we need to discuss to, be, to find that it's nothing. And it's nothingness is the part that shows us why it has no power. So, um, the third theme, the third jewel inside the kaleidoscope, again, it, it comes from the Bible about this healing being such an important element of salvation. In this case, this is a, depicting uh, Jesus who's casting out a demon or an evil spirit, which is a form of saving him. Now, again, in the second century, the demon caused all the problems you could have, whether you're sick or sinful or dying or whatever the problem is, is because a demon did it to you. So the saviors were there to remove and conquer demons. So there, there would be sickness or sin or death. Now this, is, this text is the most specific text I've seen in these ancient texts that so dramatically pulls together salvation and healing and showing you the reasons for these three things to go together. So what I thought we would, oh, I also want to mention this too. These ideas, these three things we're talking about, were not without opposition. One of the most important and well-known church fathers, Irenaeus, wrote a well-known book known as Against the Heresies, where he argued specifically against the teachings of the secret revelation of John. And in fact, it wasn't even until 1945, when the Nag Hammadi texts were found, that we even knew had any, um, we, we didn't have any other uh, um, evidence of the text other than what Irenaeus said, who hated it. It would be as if someone who hates science and health takes one or two passages and shows you how evil it is, and that's all you know about it for 1,400 years. <laughs> so that's why this discovery is so extraordinary, because it's not taken out of context anymore. In fact, we find out why it's a message of healing in the second century. So these same three themes appear now in the, in, um, the 19th century. So pick up your imaginary kaleidoscope, since this one's not going to move, turn it, and we see those same gems are there. We're moving into the 19th century. Now, I'm not going to spend the time teaching you science and health because I presume all of you here are convinced that it has those three themes in it. But I've set up a conversation between our understanding of science and health and the second century to show us the meaning of, of how these ideas can move through different uh, cultural periods and yet still be just as powerful, just as important, just as meaningful, and just as healing. So, Mary Baker is writing in the 19th century that God is omnipotent and loving. Can you think of passages in science and health where you know that? I hope so. <laughs> she wrote this during the Civil War, right after the Civil War. Think of it. That was a devastating time in America because God had promised that this, this new land was God's own idea. And for it to be self-destructive was terrifying in addition to the human suffering that was going on. And so preachers in those days were saying, we've been punished for our sins. We've been punished for our sins. And Mary Baker already says, God is omnipotent and loving. She also teaches that evil is a fraud in so many words. How many of you recognize things in her own writings, for example, about animal magnetism, that it's a fraud. It has no power, no truth, no legitimacy, no authority, no origin. It may bug you, but it has no power to hurt you. She used the term animal magnetism to express it. <clears throat> now, and the third theme, that healing is not relegated to antiquity, but still is an element of salvation. Do you see that in science and health? <laughs> you better. <laughs> Interestingly, the orthodox views of Christianity still oppose these three spiritual themes, omnipotence, the unreality of evil, and the correlation of healing and salvation, but they persist. So, 
you know that Mary Baker Eddy argues that mind is all and that spirit mind is the only creator and that creation is fully spiritual. Uh, but I want to just consider a little bit more about, in addition to the Civil War, let's think about what's happened between her and us and what she was dealing with to say these things. In addition to the Civil War, there was also Newtonian physics that everybody was living with in her day. Darwin had made his case by the time she wrote Science and Health. And it was shocking the religious world who was losing faith Losing faith because the new scientific discoveries were saying you can't have faith in God. It's a material creation and it's a material evolution. And so despite this, Mary Baker is still arguing that God is the creator. She argues that time and space are not laws of existence. She teaches that timelessness and matter is but a misconception of reality. Science and health also upholds theme two, exposing the fraudulence of evil. It's interesting to think about what animal magnetism was doing in the 19th century. This concept had taken the Western world by storm. Both England and uh, Europe and America were smitten by this idea, the notion that animal magnetism might just be the new amazing idea that would heal people mentally. Now, I don't want to get into that whole story either, but it's important to recognize how very, very powerful that was in the 19th century. It was related to spiritualism, it was related to um, all these kinds of mental, hypnotic uh, forms of, hip of um, uh, mental treatment. But Mary Baker Eddy exposed the animal nature of it and said this is not a healing mechanism. In fact, it's a fraud. It's telling you that there's a power that isn't God. Now, it's it, it, again, it treats, it's like the demons of the second century in that it's invisible, but both demons and animal magnetism function as a power that seems to manipulate humans and torture them physically, mentally, and morally. And they're exposed as fraudulent and impotent uh, because they do not come from God. The third theme is also interesting what happened um, to it in the 19th century. By that time, the Western Church had bifurcated or split the meaning of salvation into two parts. Saving from hell after death is one part. Healing the body before death is the other part. And we talked about the fact that they were interwoven in the first centuries. But by the 19th century, they had been split. So the way to be saved from hell after death is to be saved from our sins. So salvation became only a moral power. The saving from bodily ailments was separated from the saving Christ, and it is strictly a bodily issue that requires material methods of treatment. So, this is why it's so significant that science and health is arguing that it's the same Christ that saves from both sin and disease because they come from the same error, the same falsity. The world that would bifurcate them, both theologically and medically, would insist that healing and salvation cannot be the same. All right, so are these three themes still possible in the 21st century? Turn the kaleidoscope again, please. And you will see those three same gems. And they've moved, they've shifted. We're in a new place. It's, it, it looks quite different. So. Now we're going to think about what's different between the 19th century and now. And is that a safe question to ask? Now, I know in my parents' generation, they were really trying to do everything that Mary Baker already said to do exactly as she said to do it, so that we wouldn't lose the purity, the sanctity, the rightness, the holiness of everything that Mary Baker already said and did. In fact, if the more we looked like the mirror image of Mary Baker already's world, the better off we would be. But now in the 21st century, we have to question that assumption. Is it possible to make ourselves mirror images of Mary Baker Eddy's culture? Or are we looking for the gems inside the kaleidoscope? The outward appearance is going to look so different. We can't compare them in, in the sense that one design is the same as the other, but the gems inside are the same.
And that's the part that we need to think about. And thinking about what kinds of things are going on in the 21st century that impact our understanding of these three things. So obviously technology is one of them. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's think a little bit about what's happened in human history since the 19th century. That makes a difference, for example, in our understanding of God's omnipotence. The Holocaust, for example. This, like the Civil War of Mrs. Eddy's day and Darwin of her day, challenged the faith in those days. But the Holocaust, how many of you know of the arguments and the fears and the doubts that have come from the Holocaust? Yeah. It's a time that people have just said, I just can't go there. I, I just can't agree that there's a God who is loving and good anymore. That's, that's for blind faith. And yet, I'm arguing that in the 21st century, and this is where this gets dicey for us, there are both challenges and reasons for defending these three ideas, these gems. Quantum physics is another thing that's happened more in the 21st century, even though I think Mrs. Eddy certainly had some ideas that were preparing the way for this. But quantum physics, at least on the particle level, lets us find that things can appear in consciousness. There's a possibility of a mind connection that has not been explained, but it's also undeniable. The um, second theme, anomagnetism is no longer a term that's really well known in society, but people think about nocebos, and they're better known to society than, than maybe animal magnetism, but they're mental connections with what's going on in the body. <clears throat> also, there's new age, psychology, humanism that seem to promote the power of the human mind. But despite these human powers, fear still dominates. Climate change threatens global security. Cyber attacks threaten. <coughs> Nuclear war threats are still threatening. They're greater than the bayonets of the 19th century. They do need to be addressed, but that's the way evil has always been. It's a new story, the same kind of evil, the same kind of gem in that kaleidoscope that's present. Is it true that evil has no origin? Is it true that evil has no power? no truth, no place, then we still have the gem that can confront these 21st century issues. The third category about healing and salvation. The meaning of healing has shifted dramatically from the 19th century. Since it has lost its connection with salvation in the theological world, at least in Western thinking, it no longer even has a distinct identification. I'm saying healing does not. It means something different to the healer, to the healed person, and to society. It means that everything from feeling better to getting along with a problem better. The biggest cause of the world change in thinking on healing and salvation, I think, is the movement known as liberation theology. How many of you are familiar with liberation theology? A good number of you. And I, it's something we should know about because it, it is so prevalent in the Christian world that we live in today. Again, this is, remember in the, back, in the beginning when I was talking about the second century Christians, I was intrigued with the way they were responding to the Romans and the Greeks of their day. It's our turn to respond to liberation theology today. I, I, just briefly, it's a, it began maybe... 40 years ago or so, in Latin America as a reaction against European powers of the Catholic Church. The people in Latin America were arguing that the Pope in Rome had no clue how to minister to Latin Americans, and that in fact the Church was participating in Western oppression. <coughs> the Church, meaning the, mainly the Catholic Church but then others, <coughs> began to realize that indeed it was causing hardship. And so it began to pay more attention to the voices of minorities and oppressed people. Now that's a good thing, to listen to those who are under your powers and who, who are being oppressed. And so liberation theology has done good things, but I also argue caused problems. 
The good things can, in fact, include the fact that, that it, it, um, it has opened the voices for women. Feminism came from this idea. Then it went on to womanism, which is a form of um, even acknowledging that not just women are oppressed, but, but black women in particular. And then ecofeminism, which is the, the world itself is being oppressed by certain practices. So these liberation theology has caused a shift from um, thinking of your, the, the central power being the church in Rome or the church itself to hearing the voices of others. It's also challenged the authority of, of the church. And in this way, it also challenges the authority of God. In other words, are people and their, their perspectives more important than God? If, if the church isn't the central authority, and the voices of the minority are the authority, then all the people and their problems have more power than those who would help them, including God. So my argument with liberation theology is that it, as it has shifted from individual salvation to salvation for the oppressed, it's also looking for um, answers outside of God, which is where I think, again, this is our 21st century challenge. It does focus on poverty, natural disasters, climate change, mass incarceration, political oppression, and on and on. But then the question is, is there a God? Is there a God who saves? Is there a God who saves here and now? Does that God save us from bodily harm as well as systemic problems? And the issue for the 21st century healing is that we need to be thinking of these things in a systemic way. And this is where healing is conceived in the world today. I argue that the bifurcation of soul and salvation from healing is what caused medicine to become the god of the bodies and salvation after death to be the god of souls. But since we're saying it's the same thing, then we're going to deal with the systemic issues of the 21st century. This is the thing that brings me hope for the 21st century. Yes, we have a challenge, but yes, we also have that kaleidoscope still contains the gems. And I think it's our particular <coughs> joyous privilege to think of how they are relevant today and how we can use them today. I want to show you a very interesting book um, that's on a bibliography I've distributed somewhere around here today. This is a book um, called The Gospel of Mary of Magdala by Karen King. It's the, that's the picture of it there. I, I, I'm showing you there the, um, a kind of an interesting comparison between Mary Magdalene and Mary Baccaretti. Mary Magdalene, as we saw from the little video, was unjustly obscured by history. Male clergy eventually turned her into a prostitute whose only place in history is to be remembered on her knees in repentance. Mary Baker Eddy also is largely obscured by our contemporary culture. So, shifting up nearly 19 centuries, I think it's extraordinary that Mary, Baker, uh, Mary Magdalene is now being understood and not only, respected, uh, not only a respected woman in the days of Jesus, but she was actually better known as the leading apostle of the apostles. How's that for a shift in thought? So if the evidence is coming to the surface about what Mary Magdalene really was about and what she did. The reason I have hope is that I think that Mary Baker Eddy will also be understood as we are faithful to those gems, those ideas that she is teaching and bringing to humanity. All of these people in the first century, the second century, the 19th century, the 21st century have faced what appear to be opposition against it. But those gems are persistent. They continue to heal body and soul. If you read this book, you will be startled to see the amazing amount of parallel between Mary Baker Eddy and Mary Magdalene. Both of these women struggled with hierarchy, patriarchy, rejection, and on and on. But both of them 
were victorious in a way that was probably too much for their own age to bear. But as the later generations who continue to see the depth of what they were teaching, that can show that it's the relevance of those gems that transcend the cultural issues that would want to, to um, uh, denounce them. So, in conclusion here, what's in that kaleidoscope that you're going to keep with you? All three themes remain. Whether they're fitting together, they're enduring. Whatever way they fit together, they are enduring ideas. No matter how the culture changes, and isn't it interesting for us to have heard the report today here, you're going through lots of changes here, but you have, are grounded on a deep foundation. These gems are permanently yours to use. How beautiful it is that we know and understand and have lived and experienced and practiced. God is good and God. omnipotent. Evil is a God. Salvation is the same as Evil. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> They're yours. Now, taking a look at these cultural differences between Jesus and the second century, and then the differences between Mary Baker Eddy's day and the 21st century helps us not to be afraid of the cultural shifts, but they inspire us to take hold of the beauty, the profound beauty of these gems and live them ever more fully. The promise is ours. Thank you. set up for today. And extra special thank yous to Haley Chichester. Haley, the back there. Lindsay, Lindsay Levanti. Lindsay. Where's Lindsay? She's, she's in the kitchen. She's working. Amy Krause. IT support from Donovan Bernal.